unplugged in. Education in a pandemic, impacting more than 1.6 billion students worldwide. From kindergarten to college, new health precautions implemented to try to keep students and teachers safe from COVID. Students, educators, and experts help us examine the impact of the coronavirus on global education. Unplugged in, education in a pandemic. Hello and welcome to Plugged In. I'm Greta Van Susteren, reporting from Washington. According to a recent United Nations report, the coronavirus pandemic is disrupting the education of 1.6 billion children around the globe. Some progress has been achieved conducting remote learning and redesigning schools to establish safe distancing. But overall, educating the world's children during the pandemic remains a big challenge. VOA Education Editor Kathleen Strzok begins our examination of education in a pandemic. From the start of the pandemic, students became some of the carriers who seeded the coronavirus around the world as it spread across the globe from Asia. Unprepared, colleges and universities in the U.S. stumbled over their responses last March. First, they sent students home, then brought them back for their belongings, only to send them home again. Months later, schools said they would reopen in the fall. While some did, many quickly shut down when COVID-19 cases increased. You've got dorms that are set up not for social distancing. You've got classrooms that are set up not for social distancing, et cetera. So you've got to refigure all of that. If they're going to be in a classroom, all of a sudden a classroom that used to hold 50 now holds 15 because they've all got to have a six foot circle around them. Uh, so having them come back has that risk. The closures have been devastating for students too. Many say online learning is lacking. Schools that had very limited online presence were transforming themselves into online education institutions. We're transferring hundreds, sometimes thousands of courses into online delivery. It was truly astonishing. And frankly, it was kind of hit and miss because schools were changing quickly. Some did better, some did worse. Students and their families balked at continuing to pay tuition and housing fees while learning remotely. Schools lost money. A lot of um, tuition dependent, meaning enrollment dependent institutions are really on the edge, right? They've uh, for a long time been offering steep tuition uh, discounts in order to lure more students to come there. Educators say the U.S. needs to take a long, hard look at where higher education is going and how it can better serve students and prepare them for the workforce. I think we need to get to a place where there's some thoughtful and creative proposals. Um, and here's one that I would put at the top of the list. How to create incentives for colleges and universities to reduce their actual costs so that we get to a place where the tuition prices are more sustainable. Meanwhile, as the coronavirus pandemic rages, colleges and universities are left wondering when campus activity might resume. Kathleen Strzok, VOA News, Washington. While schools had several months to plan strategies to hold in-person and online classes, the persistence of the virus and the physical return of students made many schools rethink their approach. Back in August, before the start of the fall semester, almost half of the nearly 1,300 higher learning institutions planned for an in-person semester. 35% planned a hybrid of the in-person and remote approach, and 14% offered an online-only curriculum. In October, as the infection rate spiked on many campuses, only 4% were fully in-person, and 23% reported primarily in-person instruction. 21% shifted to a hybrid model, while the rest shifted to a combination of primarily and fully remote. Nearly half of America's colleges and universities are now conducting remote learning. But according to the U.S. Department of Education, just one-third of college students had some type of online course experience prior to the pandemic. Lynn Pascarella is president of the Association of American Colleges and Universities. We spoke earlier about the impact of the coronavirus on education. COVID has had an enormous impact on global education, not only in terms of enrollment, but the diversity on college campuses, the uncertainty, the need to pivot to online education. And with that, an unveiling of the 
uh, shelter, food insecurities, and the expansiveness of the digital divide that uh, has gotten greater as a result of this crisis. I think this is a moment of enormous opportunity for higher education to reimagine ourselves and to reinvigorate our commitment to the democratic purposes of higher education. And so we will leverage technology in new and innovative ways and partner more meaningfully with colleges and universities across the country and around the world. Uh, what has surprised me the most is really the, the ways in which the higher education community pivoted so quickly, um, changed their pedagogical approaches, engaged in uh, training of faculty and staff, and the ways that students um, took up the challenge to excel under these most extraordinary circumstances. Is there any substitute for on-campus uh, education? I think there isn't a real substitute. When I think about my own undergraduate days, and I learned as much sitting on the residence hall floor as talking to my friends about what they were doing in their classes. So I wasn't just taking four classes a semester or five, but, but really felt like I was taking everyone's class I was engaged with in, in, in the residence halls in the dining hall. Um, but students today are so tech savvy and they create online communities. Uh, and so they are maybe playing a video game with 300 people in their group around the world or connecting with uh, old classmates through Facebook or other social media. And so there are, are opportunities for us to learn from the ways in which people connect um, that's different from what we had in higher education a decade ago. I assume that labs are going to be a huge problem. I mean, you can take a course in, in history online or Zoom, but if you want to take chemistry or um, other lab courses, that that creates a challenge that I don't know how we're going to accommodate that. It does. Many institutions are holding their lab courses or studio art courses face to face, but all other classes are remote. And yet there is extraordinary technology out there that helps us to conduct experiments, to engage in dissections virtually. And so, especially with virtual reality, there, there are new opportunities to make pedagogical changes that provide broader access for people around the world. I suppose technology makes it less bad, but I mean, is there, is there any substitute for actually having your hands on and doing a dissection of a of a frog or, or or cadaver, whatever it's been, you know, can it ever be the same as being there doing it yourself? I think there are some good substitutions, but I think there is value in face-to-face -face learning, that peer interaction, grappling with unscripted problems and diverse teams. This can happen virtually, but there is something about being in a place together that can foster imagination, especially moral imagination. Is there, do you have any sort of thought of whether the adjustment for this distance learning, whether it be by Zoom or an online course, um, as to who's been able to, who has the easier adjustment? Is it teachers or students? Oh, I think it's been a challenge for both. Uh, we've seen decreases in enrollment uh, are dramatic this year, 16%, uh, and 22.7% of community college attendees are not able to attend college. And so we know that it, there's responsibility at home that creates obstacles for people attending college, but these same responsibilities are present for professors. And so everyone's life has been upended as a result of this crisis. Are universities in this country feeling a financial pinch? They are on a number of levels. It's, it's a lack of the capacity to do fundraising, to hold big events. Um, to hold football games and, and fundraisers, booster events that go along with that, but also uh, engaging with alumni around the world. And, and state support has decreased in the United States for public colleges and universities. And so all of this is coming together to have a profound impact on higher education, which is one reason in the U.S. why there's such a, a call for increased funding under a new CARES Act. Do you see any universities or colleges going bankrupt because they get, they get uh, there's so much money involved in even housing students, food service, um, and, and security, so much on a campus. But are we going to see universities here in this country go bankrupt? We've seen a few already. Uh, many are small liberal arts, faith-based institutions. Um, but those that serve the underserved are most at risk. And so if you look at HBCUs, uh, Latino-serving institutions, um, tribal colleges, 
their students already have such great financial aid needs. And now to have to provide computers to the students to be able to have access to courses um, to deal with the food and shelter insecurities that so many of their students experience, especially if they can't live on campus, has has led to a breaking point for some of these colleges and universities at the moment when we need them the most. The people who don't have much money, students who are really struggling um, and maybe you know don't have the family background or the government assistance, is there, are, are the universities providing computers? Is there access to sufficient broadband? I mean, what's being done to, to, to address the people who don't have as much as others might have? Colleges and universities, particularly community colleges, are distributing computers to all of their students. We saw right after uh, the, the COVID-19 shutdown in March that students were lining up uh, in digital parking lots to take their courses or to take exams because they didn't have access to high-speed internet necessary to, to do the work of their courses. Uh, and so now colleges and universities are paying increased attention to these needs as we look toward the spring semester. If you were someone from a, a country, not the United States, and you couldn't get a visa for whatever reason to travel mm -hmm. here to go to school, is that now you can go to school. I mean, there's because we know visa impediment. You can do it all online or, or by Zoom. Yes, but as you pointed out, uh, there is some richness in face-to-face -face learning, and that diversity is what makes American higher education distinctive. The fact that we have so many people from around the world who are seeking to study in the U.S., and it allows us to uh, engage in diversity, speaking across differences, and the innovation that's necessary to, to address the co problems like COVID-19. What about the t testing, the entrance exams? A lot of these schools rely on the ACT, SAT, law school has LSAT. They all have entrance exams so they can try to figure out which is the best fit student for what university. What happens to those exams? Uh, they've been suspended uh, for one or two years in many cases, even among the Ivy League institutions in the U.S., and others are rethinking their approach. We know that the, the California state system has said we're not going to use SATs and ACTs any longer. Moving away from standardized measures is critically important at this moment of racial reckoning in America as higher education takes responsibility for the ways in which we've been complicit in perpetuating hierarchies of human value. Thank you very much for joining me. No, it was really my pleasure. Thank you. According to a recent UN report, more than 370 million children in 195 countries were impacted by the loss of health and nutrition services during the first months of the pandemic. In the United States, many parents have been unable to find alternative solutions for childcare services. Older parents are also adjusting to a new reality with their grown children coming back to the nest. VOA reporter Karina Bafrajan tells us more. The grown children of writer and columnist Mary Dell Harrington are living at home these days. When the pandemic hit, both her son and daughter decided to leave New York and stay with their parents in a large house in Georgia. You know, we've all gone down the sort of uh, COVID learning curve where we sort of figure out, figured out how to, how to coexist. It's made me more appreciative toward my children and the closeness that we have. For some, moving back in with their parents is a choice, but for the overwhelming majority, it's a pandemic-inspired necessity due to job loss or closed university campuses. According to the Pew Research Center, the number of young Americans living with their parents has grown by over 2.5 million since the start of the pandemic. But experts say the pandemic has just accelerated a trend that was already growing. And so now that people marry later, they stay in education longer, they have cohabiting relationships that may end after a while, they uh, have jobs that are short-term jobs, um, it takes longer to get a, a job that is a long-term job than it used to. And you put all those things together, it makes sense that more of them would be living with their parents or moving back home with their parents. 23-year-old Yaroslava Zonova moved to the United States from Russia in 2017. She has been living with her parents since then, 
She says she earns enough to afford her own place, but believes it's easier to get through tough times surrounded by family. It's not that we just live together as a family. My mom and I are also colleagues. We work at the same school and prepare for classes together. When the quarantine started, and it was the happiest time for me, we started making art together and started our own project. It has been common in the U.S. for children to start living separately from their parents after they go to college. But for the last six months, 22-year-old Fletcher Lowe has lived with his big family. I think that sometimes we stigmatize that living with your parents. Um, just so I, I think sometimes we paint with this brush of like that being like a failure. And I really don't think it is, because oftentimes we just, no matter how hard we work, we're victims of our circumstance. Like, you know, it's like, take my case, for instance, you know, I was able to, I uh, had a job after graduation and then I just couldn't because, you know, there was a global pandemic. The trend is true among all ethnic groups, and it's hard to tell now whether that will change after the pandemic is finally over. Karina Befredjian for VOA News, Washington. Millions of parents, students and teachers are showing resilience and resourcefulness in the face of an unprecedented disruption brought on by the pandemic. While technology is making distance learning possible, experts say it is revealing broader inequities that impact low-income families and students with learning disabilities. John Katzman is the co-founder of the Princeton Review, one of the top college admission services groups. For nearly 40 years, he has created and led education technology companies we spoke about the benefits and challenges of remote learning and how digital technology is reshaping higher education. Online higher ed has been growing pretty steadily for the past decade. Uh, of adult learners and people going to graduate school, we were up to about 35% of students studying completely online. Um, obviously with the pandemic, that's gone to 100%. Post pandemic, it'll probably be over 50 right from the get-go. I think we're in a whole new path. COVID is an accelerant to changes that were happening anyway. Generally, when we build a program with a university, we'll double its size, we'll triple its size. The number of students studying online is a little larger than the number of students studying on campus, but very few of them have any real appetite to 10x uh, the number of students they see on campus. Uh, so, at, at faculty, are, do they seem to, they're satisfied doing this online teaching? Look, there are, uh, there are online courses and there are courses that have been thrown into Zoom and they're different. So, if you and I were to take a, a course you were teaching and bring it online, it would take about 100 hours of our time. I would be employing videographers animators, uh, people creating simulations. We would be working hand in glove over the next couple of months to create something that blended work that students can do on their own, work that you're going to be teaching them over video conferencing into something really good. It's this interesting that the Zooming is, is different. It's just a lecture on camera. So it's not, it, it's, it's a different challenge. Yeah, it could be a class. It could be more interactive, but, but it's like if, if you like uh, theater, uh, you could just put a camera in the back of the theater and say, well, isn't it the same thing? And it's not. Um, but if you're going to take a play and turn it into a movie and you're thoughtful about it, you can make a great movie. You can give a really great experience because you, can, you lose something of the immediacy. You lose something of the community that you're in, but you gain something else in terms of uh, the ability to uh, uh, take, take people outside the building and zoom in and zoom out and cut in different kinds of ways. And good online instruction loses something, but gains something else. Do you see it as disruptive to the economy or, I mean, these, these universities, because they have lots of them have dormitories, they have food service, they have people who are medical people providing medical services. I mean, if more and more people are online or taking courses by Zoom post-vaccine, um, that it's going to be, is it not going to be rather rude financial awakening for many universities? This is very difficult. Uh, number one, uh, usually about 5% of freshmen at elite schools 
decide to defer and not to come this year. This year, it's closer to 15 percent. So all of a sudden, you've got a substantial number of seats on campus, of beds on campus unfilled, and that's a financial hit to a lot of schools. Second, uh, the the uh, students who are on campus, they're on, they're off. You've got to protect people. You've got to protect your faculty and administrators. The cost of navigating around the safety issues is enormous, and uh, this is this is a tough road for higher ed. It's a tough road for the whole world, though. But think how it opens the door. Like this show goes all around the world that if you live on the African continent, but you don't want to leave your family of a sick family member and it's such a, a long trip and you won't be able to get home or to care for, is that you can you can actually go to school in the United States and vice versa, United States and the African continent um, without going anyplace and having sort of the enriched education of having a very diverse uh, student student body, so to speak. Where I see that playing out, you're uh, in West Africa, and there are great African universities perhaps partnering with American universities to say, let's share some technology and content. We'll use our professors here. We'll keep tuition at a level that's competitive here, but offer a diploma and certificate that, that make you a global citizen. And, uh, and what kinds of sharing will make sense in that world, I think, is going to play out really differently in different parts of the world and with different schools. So who, post-COVID, with a vaccine, um, who loses in the go, doing this distance learning with higher education? Every industry, every sector um, that is disrupted by technology has tended to consolidate. There are fewer newspapers than there were. There are fewer of everything, uh, stores. There will be fewer universities, each with more students. And so the losers will be colleges and universities that don't have a strong enough brand, either nationally or regionally, to compete against schools that are, have stronger reputations and are able to drive their technology, increase their capacity, lower their costs, and now you're against a competitor who is better known, less expensive, and more flexible in terms of technology, and 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 you'll and you'll go out of business. Sir, thank you very much for joining me. No, thank you for having me, Greta. The United Nations says 40% of the poorest countries are failing to support at-risk students during the pandemic. In Uganda, new broadcast channels have been created to help fill that gap. VOA's Halima Athmani tells us about the challenges parents face in this new reality. 14-year-old Ugandan Musa Sewanyana has mastered the art of bricklaying. He should be in high school, laying the foundation of his education. But since Uganda closed schools in March to contain the spread of the novel coronavirus, Sewanyana has few options. During the school break, I'm still reading my books. If we get money, we switch the TV on and follow the teachings. But I also do odd jobs, so I don't spend the whole day at home. Unlike families who are financially able to study online, Sawanyanas cannot always afford the power needed to watch lessons on state TV or the $3 per day subscription. His mother, Naiga Rashida, says the past five months have been difficult with her three children at home. I don't have electricity. I had even bought them a new television set, knowing they would use it to study. But there are times when even the solar battery doesn't charge and the television goes off. Uganda vowed to buy televisions and radios for poor communities with school children, but has yet to act. A $150 million July World Bank grant is expected to soon help provide learning materials for students nationwide. But some Ugandan education authorities say the damage is already done, including from school properties that were sold off or sitting vacant. The chairs, there were some of them were eaten by ants. So by the time we reopen schools, we may need now to replenish, to, to buy another set of furniture. Eh? And that again goes with it. But that said, the loss of jobs for our teachers and what losing property. 
But even in losing our learners, we are worried the sensible percentage may not come back to school. Education charity groups like Uwezo, which means capability in Kiswahili, says COVID-19 has caused both a health and education crisis. When schools eventually reopen, says Uwezo Executive Director Mary Goretti Nakavugo, children will have to make up for lost time. The starting point would be to try and give a simple assessment to understand the level at which each of these kids is. Otherwise, if you take them as a whole, many of them are going to be left behind. And the ones who are going to be left behind are mainly the ones in the low-income families. Meanwhile, Uganda's Ministry of Education is planning a campaign aimed at parents to encourage homeschooling. Halima Athmani for VA News, Kampala. The pandemic's impact on colleges and universities has also touched our plugged-in team. Our two interns who are pursuing bachelor's and master's degrees in international relations, politics, and business have had to navigate learning and living at college in the era of COVID-19. We asked them about their experience. Hello, my name is Arjun Ramachandran. and I'm currently in my third year at Carnegie Mellon University. Going into the semester, no one really knew what would happen. What would happen with the pandemic, how schools would handle bringing students back to campus. It was all really in disarray throughout the summer. Even going into the semester, my parents were really worried, as I'm sure all parents were. This semester, I'm doing a program in D.C., so along with working at Voice of America and on the Plugged In team, I'm taking classes on CMU's D.C. campus. Our program is quite small, only about 14 people, so we're able to have in-person classes this semester. And the school has taken an abundance of caution by mandating social distancing, mask wearing, and even deep cleaning the classroom every single night. Although we have not had any COVID cases so far, there are several contingencies plans in place to make sure in case there is a case, it doesn't impact the rest of the program or impact the faculty and the students. Although we may not be getting the full DC experience this semester, such as going to the Kennedy Center for concerts or going to the Smithsonian, being here during the election season and working at VOA and on the plugged in team who have some of the most amazing people I've met um, these experiences are something I'll always cherish and I'll never forget. Hi, my name is Cassie Passantino and I am currently a graduate student at the Catholic University of America in the Master's of Science in Business program. My program is a cohort, so the 37 of us actually take all of our classes together. So we've just been meeting in an auditorium, two seats apart, two rows apart, six feet on all sides. We wear masks, we have plexiglass between us and our professors just to keep us and everybody else safe. In addition to school right now, I am also completing an internship with Voice of America's Plugged In. And I think that's been the biggest change in how I'm used to doing internships. Though we have gotten a pretty good system going of how we've been doing work, getting the show on the air, even remote, it's, it's definitely a little bit sad to know that I will never actually meet in person, or at least not in the foreseeable future, the teammates that I have been working with. At the end of the day, we've been so grateful, and I've been so grateful to be able to, to take classes in person and to not have to do another semester of Zoom University. And I feel like most of my classmates have been feeling the same way, despite all the bumps in the road and things not going and the semester not looking exactly how we expected it to. Still being able to make the best of it, get the most out of our education, be with our professors in person, be with each other in person, and be able to have the best grad experience possible despite these very crazy times and despite all of the changes that have been going on. That's all the time we have for now. Thank you to my guests, Lynn Pascarella, and John Katzman. And my thanks to our interns who did a great job helping to produce this episode. Stay up to date with our website, voanews.com, and follow me on Twitter, at Greta. Thank you for being plugged in.